Well, Acts chapter 8, where we left off last week, we're, we're entering a new chapter in the book of Acts as we survey. Um, Acts chapter 8, you see now on the scene a man named Saul, and you and I know what, what Christianity doesn't pay attention to is that Saul soon becomes our Apostle Paul, the apostle of us Gentiles. So in Acts chapter 8, we actually saw this man, Saul, at the end of Acts chapter 7. Uh, let's look at that. Acts chapter 7, if you will. And verse, start at verse 55. Go down to verse 58 for time's sake. Acts chapter 7, verse 58. And cast him out, speaking of Stephen, out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. As we look into your word again in the book of Acts, uh, this transitional book of the activities and actions of the apostles, starting with the 12 apostles to Israel, and, and, and pretty soon that one unique, distinct uh, uh, apostle named Paul, we give you thanks and praise. And we ask that you, uh, you uh, give us the eyes of understanding and, and enlighten our understanding of these passages, Father, so that we can enjoy your word, but most importantly, increase our faith to trust you more because of the truthfulness of your word. We thank you for all this in Christ's name. Amen. Here's the first time you see Paul show up. Saul is his Hebrew name. Saul was the first king of Israel. I'm sorry. Yes, the first king, first official king of Israel. Although he didn't, uh, he started off well, but he didn't do too well. The king, that, the king that the Bible talks most about is King David. But David was Saul's predecessor. Saul started off well, but as a, as a type of Israel, but then he fell off. He, he left God's word. And then uh, this David shows up on the scene, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Saul here, who was a Benjamite like, the, like King Saul, was a young man, a religious man. Now later Paul calls himself Paul the Aged in Philemon. I was telling the people in the first session, and you'll see in the, second, in the, the next session, Paul's ministry was over 30 years, oh, it was over 30 years. And in that time he got visions and revelations that completed the mystery. So he didn't get it all at once. You need to rightly divide Paul's epistles. But here, when it says they laid their feet, I'm sorry, their clothes at the feet, it'd be hard to lay your feet down. <laughs> Take your feet off. They laid their clothes at, the, at, at a young man's feet whose name is Saul. The they there are the false witnesses who falsely accused Stephen. And under Israel's law, you couldn't condemn a man to death but under two or three eyewitnesses. And they bared false witness. That's one of the actual Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That's what they did, the same way they did for the Lord. And they murdered a man who was filled with the Holy Ghost, and they committed the unpardonable sin. Now, with that, hold your hand here. you got to see this. Go to Luke 19. I told you last week, I'm going to show you that what was going on when they stoned Stephen was a message was being sent from the religious leaders of Israel to God and his anointed that we will not have your son to reign over us. Uh, Luke chapter 19, look at verse 11. And as they heard these things about the fact that the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Jesus Christ has been rejected by Israel. And even his apostles didn't grasp the fact that he had to die first be buried and resurrected, actually go into the heavenly places, get his kingdom and come back in the second coming. And because they kept force, trying to force him to be king immediately, he's he going to give them a parable, okay? And when it says he was nigh to Jerusalem, he's on the way to the cross. Verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom, now look at the last three words, and to do what? The nobleman, that certain nobleman, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is going to go into heaven, receive, as Daniel says and Revelation says, the kingdom from the ancient of days, the Father, and then return. That's over here, future from us. It's not going to happen immediately. He has to do some things, die on a cross, be rejected, go. And, but watch this. Now, from verse 13 on down, he's going to deal with his servants, the little flock, the believing remnant going through the tribulation. They had to continue on uh, uh, being faithful, and that's what he's going to deal with. But not only that, he's going to deal with his enemies as well. Uh, you got 
you, you got uh, verse 12. Go down, if you will, to verse 26. So he's going to deal with his, his, when Christ comes back, the first people he's going to deal with is going to be the little flock, okay, how faithful they were. If they were faithful of a little, he'll make them ruler of a much. That's what the, t the servants and the pounds and all that, that's the, the believing remnant, how faithful they are with, with uh, what Christ gave them in the word, okay? Just like you and I, as members of the body, we're going to be judged on our faithfulness to God's word to us through Paul at the judgment seat. Well, they are. He's going to judge them right here when it is his return. But then next thing he's going to do, he's going to deal with his enemies in Israel. And that's what you see in verse 26. Luke chapter 19, verse 26. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. So he's talking about the faithful and the unfaithful uh, members of the little flock there. Now, look what he says in verse 27. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Now, what's that? Well, go back to ch in chapter 19. Go up there. Look at verse 14. Acts 9, I'm sorry, Luke 19, 14. But his citizens, these are the members of the nation of Israel, his citizens did what? Hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And what's going on with the stoning of Stephen is this. The rulers of Israel, by stoning Stephen, killing him, they're sending a message. They're saying after him, sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. In essence, Israel is declaring war on God and his anointed. That's the, the Psalms 2 and Psalms 110. So that's what's happening. When you go back to Acts chapter 7, look at it. It was after Stephen says, behold, I see, I, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, that they kill him, they murder him. Um, Saul is the chief persecutor of Stephen and his Saul was the one when it says they laid their clothes verse 58 Acts 7 58 what's going on there when it says they laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name is Saul what they're doing is they're honoring him they're, they're, they, they place their clothes at his feet they're honoring this man it is Saul we're going to find out who led the rebellion and that's what's going on here look at chapter 8 I'm going to read the chapter and then we'll get into it Every time we start a new chapter, we'll, we'll read it through so you can get it. Verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which is at, was, was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad except uh, throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men, if you're cold, I can turn that off. Okay. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering into every house, inhaling men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to, a, to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits cried with, a loud, with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time, he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. 
And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this, wick of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read, uh, chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a, dumb, a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to us unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, Paul says, give attendance to reading. So we read the whole chapter to get the sense. What I'm going to do is we're going to start in verse 1 and break down. This is a, a, a very great change in God's program. Because now you're going to see um, the, the persecution toward the little flock increase substantially through a man named Saul, okay? Uh, look at verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. By consenting unto his death, Saul was agreeing that Stephen ought to be put to death. In fact, it was Saul we're going to see who, who was the one leading the rebellion. He desired. We're going to see in Acts 9. He went and he was out there grabbing Messianic Jews, as it were, kingdom saints, and committing them to, to prison and to death, Is going to say. He's going to tell us later he was an injurious and a persecutor and a blasphemer against the way of Christ. He was, he was, he was trying to destroy them and the Christian faith, uh, that, that messianic faith, as it were. Now, it says he was consenting to his death, verse 1, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which is at Jerusalem. Um, when it says at Jerusalem, the, the place that God always starts in Israel's program is the city of the great king, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital city of that nation of Israel. God always starts there. The way God does it, he starts at Jerusalem, then Judea. Judea is the, is the, uh, the regions right outside of, of, uh, of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in the southern part of the kingdom. Uh, Judea is, is like the suburban area of it. Then Samaria, which is the northern ten tribes area, and then the uttermost parts of the world. That's how it is. Um, back in Solomon's day, because of the pride of Israel, the, I'm going to keep that from that blowing, God, the 12 tribes were one, but God broke them up, broke the power of, of that nation because of their pride. Ten southern tribes, Israel, 
and two, uh, I'm sorry, two southern tribes and ten northern tribes, Israel and Judah. Well, his promise was that he would take the two of them and put them back one again. The new covenant is for the house of Israel and the house of Judah to become the house of Israel again. That's what's going on here, but there's great persecution because it starts there at Jerusalem. That's where the religious leaders are at, okay? Uh, look at verse 1 again. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now that's important because the Lord told them in Acts 1, ye shall remain in Jerusalem. The persecution was tough, but the apostles were not afraid. The rest of the little flock scattered because of this persecution, but the apostles, Peter and, and, and the 11, they stayed there. They didn't move. That'll tell you about their courage and their belief that Christ rose from the dead and that he talked to them after his resurrection because he told them to stay there, and they did. That's Acts chapter 1 in, in the book of Luke and all the other ones. He says, you're going to stay there. And the 12 stayed there even, because of the, even in spite of the persecution. Now, look at verse 2. It says, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Um, when Stephen died and his spirit went to be with the Lord, his soul and spirit went to be with Christ, as his body's there, they, uh, the Jewish custom was to embalm him and things like that and put the spices in the burial. But they had this uh, lamentation. They had this whole ceremony where they were grieved for their dead. And these devout men, devout according to the law, they did it according to the law. Uh, but these were believers. These were Messianic Jews who loved Stephen. And they buried him, okay? Verse 3, as for Saul, now the picture goes back to Saul, the persecutor. He made havoc of the church. That word havoc means... He destroyed them. He made their lives miserable. At every turn, he tried to destroy these people and, and make it hard. Religious persecution. I, I wrote a note here. Saul was probably, uh, he saw of Tarsus. Saul was, he, this was his life. He, he was a, a student of Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher in the synagogues of Tarsus. But he also made tents. That was his craft, okay? Um, and so he knew about these people. I also believe that Saul was probably related to Barnabas through marriage. It looks like Saul's sister could have been Barnabas' wife. We, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. But so he knew about this stuff. He knew about these people, and he didn't like what he was hearing about this Jesus, okay? And so he made their life miserable. Look what he did, verse 3. Entering into every house, wherever he found these Jewish Messianic uh, believers, he'd go in there because he had... Uh, he had authority from the chief priests to do this, the religious leadership of Israel. And hailing men and women committed them to prison. Now, that's unusual. It, was, it wasn't unusual to, to get the men. In those Middle Eastern cultures, they'd kill off the adult men. They'll leave, sometimes they'll leave the, 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 the young uh, male children. Sometimes they kill off the, all the males. But at least they would leave the women. He was so relig in his religious fury that he committed the women to prison. That was almost non-existent in that day in the Middle East culture there. So you can tell this guy was brutal. He even took women. He didn't, he didn't the women as the, as the more feminine, weaker vessel, as it were, he didn't care. He destroyed them, man. He wanted to stamp out this Jesus of Nazareth and his people. Look at verse 4. It says, uh, th therefore, there were, uh, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, I want to talk to you about this passage here because most commentaries and most Christians believe that this is the fulfilling of the Great Commission. See, they were in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. First problem with that is, remember he said the apostles stayed at Jerusalem. The Great Commission was given to the apostles. Christ said that to his 12 apostles. They were to do that, and they're going to fulfill all that through Israel in the kingdom. But the fact remains is they weren't going out preaching the gospel according to the Great Commission. They were out there because of the persecution. And by the way, Acts chapter 11, look at verse 19. Look at Acts 11:19. 19. The Holy Ghost gives you a little commentary about this preaching the word. Look what it says, Acts 11:19. 19. When they were out there, what were they, who were they preaching to? Acts eleven nineteen. Now they, which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to everyone they encountered, both Jew and Gentile. Know what I'm saying? 
watch this, Acts 11, preaching the word to none but unto the who? Jews, last word, only. When they were out there preaching the word, it was the word of the Jewish kingdom to come through Jesus Christ, they would not talk to any Gentiles. I am not sent into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When you go, the Lord says, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Don't talk to them. When these Jews were scattered, they preached the word to none but the Jews only. That's important. That's a dispensational understanding of the scriptures. These people were not dealing with Gentiles yet. I say yet because it's not until after Paul that they, they even realized God is even going to deal with Gentiles. And it took Peter's vision there in Acts chapter 10 to get it. And the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. So go back to, 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 to chapter 8. So when it says in verse 1, look at the end of uh, verse 1, and they were all scattered abroad. Think about that. Just remember they, they were scattered, but they were preaching the word. Verse 4, they therefore that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. If you like to make notes, I put to the Jews only, Acts eleven nineteen. 19. That goes together with that. Verse, verse 5. Then Philip, now watch. The Holy Ghost says, hey, there's a guy named Saul out here persecuting. But it's not stopping God's program. The apostles are where Christ told them to stay Jerusalem. They're not going anywhere. God is protecting them. The little flock, the rest of them are scattered abroad for their own protection, getting them out of there. They're out there preaching the kingdom to any Jews that they see amongst the Gentiles. Remember, there was Jews in dispersion for, for, for centuries. It says, then Philip. Now watch it focus on Philip. They focused on one of those deacons from Acts 6, Stephen. He got stoned. Philip was one of these guys too. Watch what happened. Verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now interesting, Samaria is actually geographically north of Jerusalem. But when you read your Bible from the beginning to the end, Jerusalem, although it's in the southern kingdom there, it always says that people go up to Jerusalem. Because it's, it's the city on the hill. It's the city of the great king. The Bible always talks about, even when you're going from north to south, you go up to Jerusalem. Just read that when you read about Jerusalem. And if you leave Jerusalem, even if you go north, you always go down. It'll say he go down from Jerusalem and up to Jerusalem. That's just interesting how God puts that. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. It's north of Jerusalem, although he went down. And preached Christ unto them. Now, the Samaritans were related to the Jews. They were of the, the Jews' blood. When God broke the nation up, Samaria became the capital of the northern ten tribes. Jerusalem was the capital of the southern two tribes. The tribe of Dan began a Baal worship system where they would not go to Jerusalem to worship. The woman at the well in John 4 the reason Christ must needs go to Samaria because they were related to the Jews. He's coming to get them too. He dealt with the Samaritans because they were, they were apostatized. They were worshiping God ignorantly, but they were trying to worship the God of their father David. They knew that God, but they had gotten so far into Baal worship, they stopped coming to Jerusalem to worship, and the Jews and the Samaritans didn't have any dealings. The woman at the well says, you Jews don't have any dealings with us, and that was wrong. They were supposed to have, that, they were brethren, okay? So what God is now doing, because Jerusalem is rejecting him, he's now going to the areas of um, Judea and Samaria, okay? Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, here's what he preached. He preached a message that's not yours and I today. He preached that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That was their salvation message. I was in a church before I got saved. They called me down this aisle. They put emotional pressure on me to do it, too. I wasn't ready, but they come on, come on. People coming up to this black full gospel church. I might go by when I get out to Chicago, show Christmas. Because, boy, they put the pressure on you. Come on, come on, let's go, get up. Everybody around you say, go, go, go. You walk down the aisle. Do you believe Jesus, Son of God? Yes. Okay, sit down there. After the thing, all right, next week you're going to get in the water, okay? We're going to water baptize. You. Okay. That was it. Well, believing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, won't save you today. It, will say, it, it, it was their salvation message in this day. Uh, look at verse 6. By the way, how do, how do you know that? 
Go down to chapter 8, verse 37. Now, if you got the wrong Bible, this part ain't going to be in there. If you have the wrong Bible, they're going to leave out this guy's confession of faith. But if you got the right Bible, it'll be in there. Verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he, the Ethiopian eunuch, he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a profession of faith. That's a clear profession. That's like one of you and I saying, I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins, was buried and rose again. That's their salvation message. When, Peter, when Christ says, whom do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? He says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the message for salvation in that day, not today. When Paul would go into Jewish synagogues, he had to preach a dual thing almost. He had to prove that Jesus was the Christ to those Jews and then say, and he died on the cross to pay for your sins. It's a new message. Oh, yeah. The Jews got a, a stumbling block to get saved, man. But that was the message. Look at verse 6. Acts 8, verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Now, the Samaritans, who were rejected by the Jews, they had a softer heart towards God's word than the Jews did, the religious Jews. It says they gave heed with one accord. The people of Samaria were ready and willing to receive. God knew what he was doing. He sent Philip right at the time where they were ready to receive the gospel of the kingdom, okay? And, but, but look, look how he did it. Hearing, verse 6, and what? Seeing the what? Miracles which he did. If there's only one gospel for today, as people claim, If, if it's the gospel of the kingdom, if you're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, as Christianity does today, it has to be accompanied by miracle signs and wonders. Every verse about the gospel of the kingdom in the context has to do with healings, miracles, signs and wonders. That's their message. It'll say they'll, they've heard the, the, the kingdom and they saw the kingdom. They heard it and saw it. Verse 7. What did they see? For unclean spirits, those are devils, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy. You ever heard of the word cerebral, cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy? It's, it's that, that condition, but also we would say uh, when someone's in a wheelchair, paralyzed. See, it's not this Benny Hinn type of stuff you see today. Christ grew people's limbs back, man. See, today they just say, well, you know, you got some cancer in there or some type of lung thing and then you something you can't see. No, no, no. A guy gets his arm blown off in the war, a Jew, and God would grow that arm back. That, see, that's real stuff. People in wheelchairs, and they got up out the wheelchair and never knew it one again. I'm talking about lame. Look what he said here. And many taken with palsies and there were lame were healed. People never walked before. By the way, that unclean spirits, what was that? Satan was squatting on Israel's, uh, on God's territory. I put it like that. It's God's land. And because Israel was worshiping Baal, Baal worship, just like psychics and people who, who, who talk to spirit guides today, the new age stuff, they're dealing with devils, Satan and his angels. And Israel, when they did that, when they bell worship, they actually could enter. In prophecy, man, let me show you something. In prophecy, they could enter in there. Christ was coming out, casting out devils. By the way, the closer we get to this day, the prophetic program, it's going to happen again. But even in our day, in our day, the closer we get to there, we got to get to here. We're here now, I believe. The closer you get, you're going to start seeing seemingly supernatural things. UFOs, not you and I, but people, lost folks. And they're going to be having these supernatural things. And magicians are going to be using sorceries and all this stuff like David Blaine. These things is going to be hard to explain. And you go, well, how's that happen? Who's doing it? Devils is doing that. Satan is. And the closer we get to the end time here, the closer we get to our end time, these things are going to become more prominent. Okay, The stage is being set in our day. Well, that's, what's, that's what happens in prophecy. You see all of these things, but they're messing around with devils. Verse 8. 
and there was great joy in that city. Oh, when the Lord Jesus Christ, his first recorded miracle, he turned water into wine. Wine in the scriptures represents joy. It, it makes a man's heart merry, it says, in, in, in moderation. Christ, as he poured that water, you know, six water pots, six the number of men, the water pot, those earthen vessels, Israel. He gave them the spirit. He poured the, the spirit is like water. He pours his spirit into them, and they have joy of that kingdom. That's what's going on. That's what's happening here. Christ through Steve, uh, Philip is casting out devils. He's healing these people. They're, they're tasting the kingdom. You know, Isaiah 35 says, in that kingdom they shall no longer. I was, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I stopped right there. I quoted for a verse, to strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knee, knees. Say to them that are fearful heart, be, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with, rec, with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as, as a harp and the tongue of the dumb shall sing and the wilderness shall break forth out streams and blood. When Christ comes, when the Messiah comes, you're going to see all these healings and miracles. In 400 years, Israel didn't see anything, hadn't heard nothing. They didn't see anything. That's why the Sadducees couldn't believe in resurrection and spirits and stuff. They hadn't seen a thing in their lifetime. But when John the Baptist talked about the Messiah, he says, Messiah comes, he's going to start healing people, opening blind eyes. Open in the, that's why Christ did that. That's why he would open the tongues of the dumb, stick his fingers in those ears and then let them hear open their eyes, healing lame people and growing limbs and stuff. He grew limbs back. Christ. And Christ is showing his power through Philip and his great joy. Verse 9. But now here comes Satan's. You know what Satan does? He counterfeits what God does. Brother Don and I were talking today. Satan tries to counterfeit the grace message, and he'll do anything. He'll, put, he'll try to put that spin on us grace believers. Here's some grace stuff, but it really, he's really, it's a really corruption of it. And whether it's prophecy or the mystery, Satan corrupts what God does. And watch what he does with, through a guy named Simon. Verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon. You know who Simon is? He's that false believer, believing Jew in the tribulation. Who, 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 who believes and endures for a time, but then falls off and, and, gets, and gets Israel to go after the Antichrist. Watch what it says about Simon. Verse 9, but there was a certain man called Simon. Interesting, his name is Simon. Do you know somebody else who has some authority in Israel named Simon? Simon who? Simon Peter. Interesting. Paul told Timothy, as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses... Here with Moses, he sent him to Pharaoh, and Moses, ca Aaron, cast down his rod. It became a serpent. Pharaoh says, I got some guys who can do that. And they did it with some sorceries, satanic sorceries. They did twice as much. In every dispensation, what God is doing, Satan counterfeits it and corrupts it by trying to, 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 to fool you. And that's what he's doing here. A guy named Simon who got the same name as Peter is out there doing some things by Satan's power. Verse 9, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used what? Sorcery. He using demonic black magic. He using satanic power to do this. Look what it says there. It says, and, what's that next word? Bewitched. Remember that show called Bewitched? I remember when I was a little boy. Josh, y'all too young for this. Y'all need to. Samantha and, and Darren. And she was, you know, everybody making a big deal. Oh, no, that was Jenny, all that stuff. Bewitched, she just, tick, 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 and make stuff happen, right? And everybody said, oh, she's a good witch. And said, no, no, no. Any of that. God says that in, if Israel was dealing with witchcraft, they were supposed to be burned, stoned. If, if you found a witch in Israel, you used to burn her. If you was dealing with rich, witchcraft, you're supposed to be stoned to death. See, God says, don't be messing around with these demonic spirits. See, it's not of God. Satan has powers, too. He can do miracles. And... Don't be messing around with astrology and this new age stuff and yoga. Yoga, by the way, that's Hinduism. They're, they're, that's them using their bodies and contorting it to worship their gods, their, their devils. Christian yoga. You ever heard of that? No such thing, man. 
you ask those Buddhists and stuff, or the Hindus, they'll tell you they're offended when you call it Christian yoga because they say, no, 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 that's our religion. See, there's, there, behind that is satanic stuff. He bewitched them. Galatians 3.1, oh, foolish Galatian, who has bewitched you, taken you away from Paul that you should not obey the truth? It means to cast a spell on you. And look what he did. He bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. You know what he did? He went around with a traveling little circus like it was. He said, come, come, come be healed. Come do this. Come see the great power of God through Simon. Uh-huh. Watch this. He bewitched them for a long time with sorceries. Verse 12. But when they, that's the people of Samaria, believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, one, and the name of Jesus Christ. Notice that. Philip preached to the Samaritans that God would now give them an earthly kingdom pretty soon. But in that kingdom, they had to receive the king, which is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Uh, the name of Jesus Christ, verse 12, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, in that program, part of the gospel of the kingdom is water baptism. Why? Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, including, including the Israelites of Samaria. The priest had to be washed with water, cleansed, Exodus 29, and then anointed with oil. Those are the, the rituals. Once you get water baptized, the next thing is to be anointed, not with oil, but with the Holy Ghost, which the oil represented. That's why they would get water baptized, then the Spirit come, happen to the Lord. The Lord did not have to get water baptized because of sins. When he tells John the Baptist, do it to fulfill all righteousness, he says, since I'm the high priest, I need to, be, I need to do the ritual, the washing of the water, and then the anointing. Well, the Holy Spirit came down, okay? Pretty soon, these people who were baptized will have their hands laid on by the apostles, Peter and John, and they'll receive the Holy Ghost. Now, watch this. They were baptized, both men and women. Verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. Now we got a problem. If you don't rightly divide the word, if you, if you don't know right division, I could get you with this one. See, right division just don't answer questions for you. It, it allows you to ask religious folk who don't rightly divide questions. They cannot answer. It says that Simon believed also, didn't it? And not only did he believe, he was water baptized. Look at the rest of that verse. And when he was what? Baptized, he continued with Philip. So let me ask you, did Simon do the things that were, that were called for? Did he believe on Jesus? Yes. Said he believed. Right? Did, was he water baptized? Yes. Watch what happens. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them. And they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thank God that you're saved eternally through the blood of Christ. And you did what it says. Is that what Peter said? Oh, no, no, no. You know what Peter says? Thy money, what's that next word? Perish with thee. Peter says, Go to hell. Oh, what he's saying? Let me tell you something. When you don't rightly divide the scriptures, in Israel's program, you could trust Christ. You could get water baptized, but if you didn't endure to the end, if you didn't continue on in the, the, the doctrine, you could die in your sins. Get two passages as we come down to conclusion. This is important. Get Ephesians chapter 1 and John chapter 20. Get Ephesians 1. We're going to look at Ephesians 1 first. There are some things that differ between the prof prophetic program and the mystery program. John chapter 20 and Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians 1 first. Verse 13. According to this verse, 
Could or should Simon had lost his salvation? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, speaking of Jesus Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, comma, he's going to define the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that, after you heard the gospel, ye what? Believed. Now what happens when ye believe? Ye were what? Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of his glory. In the grace message, when you and I believe on the Lord Jesus, when we trust him by faith, believe on him, the Holy Ghost comes and seals, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. God the Father seals you with the Holy Spirit, but he also gives you the Holy Spirit in your heart. And it's a down payment, just like when you buy a house, you pay that earnest money as proof that you're going to give the rest. It's a, it's a good faith. God, in his good faith to give you eternal life in the heavenly places, gave you the Holy Spirit, and he sealed you with it too. He's in you, and he seals you. If that's the case, that's what happens to you and I. How in the world could Simon lose his salvation? He believed because you're in a different dispensation. And according to the dispensation of prophecy, they, they did not have eternal security the way you and I do. That's a blessing of God's grace to us. You can say amen, praise the Lord, because once you're saved, you're eternally sealed. You can never lose your salvation based on your, your sin. But a Jew had to continue on. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved, the Lord says. John chapter 20, as we come down to the end. John 20. Look at verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so I send I you. Speaking of the apostles. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, this is John who called those things would be not as though they were. The actual pouring out on the apostles was in Acts 2. We saw that, okay? But look at verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. That word remit is like forgive. The reason the Roman Catholic Church put a priest in a box and have you come and nail, kneel down and, 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 and confess your sins to him. By the way, James said confessing our sins one to another. He's supposed to, by scriptures, tell you his too, but they don't do that. The reason they do that, though, is because of this passage. They will tell you, I went to a Roman Catholic uh, funeral on Friday. They had the whole deal. Me and Krista, we had our eyes open. I hadn't been in a ch Roman Catholic church since I was about nine. She has never been in one, the whole deal of it. And it was eye-opening. Boy, I see why you stay lost, because it's just religious. <laughs> and if you don't open your Bible, if you just listen to what this goof says up there in the long row, but the thing, you lost. Here's what these guys do. You can forgive sins based on this passage if you think that you're in succession to Peter and the apostles like the Roman Catholic Church, the priests do. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. These guys as apostles had the ability to remit people's sins in the name of Jesus Christ, but also to say, Simon believed, Simon was baptized, Peter's going to tell him, not happening, man. Your heart not right, bro, and so I'm putting your sins back on you. That's what he did. Look here. Go back to Acts 9 as we conclude. Uh, Acts 8, excuse me. If you don't rightly divide, you're going to think you can lose your salvation based on a passage like this. And they're used, Christian, Christian teachers use passages like this. And in Hebrews, if, if we neglect so great salvation and sin willfully and all these verses, they use that to teach you and I we can lose our salvation. Paul says you can't. Once you're saved... If we believe not, he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You're a member of the body, but not them. Let's end here. Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 13. And Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. By the way, all Simon wanted was that power to do his, his thing, man. He wanted to be somebody. Verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. Now why would they do that? 
Because in order to receive the Holy Ghost, another difference in our dispensation. When you and I trust Christ, we don't need somebody to lay hands on us. Paul is dead. He was the last apostle. He's dead. You don't need apostle this guy or that guy to come lay hands. You get the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1 says, the moment you trust Christ. But they didn't. Look at this. They sent Peter and John because Christ told them where two or three are gathered in my name. It wasn't just people in a little flock or the church. It was apostles. If you can have two apostles who represent the kingdom, two or three, whatsoever they bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever they loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Peter and John went down there. Peter and James and John were the big three, but those two, it was only needed two as a witness. They went down and said, Samaria, you received the Lord Jesus. And they went through the people and started laying hands on each one. And the moment they laid hands, Holy Spirit came right up on them and they spoke with new tongues is what happened. That's my study. Now watch this. Verse 15, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now look, what the, look at the parentheses, verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon some of them. How many of them? None. Again, you need to rightly divide. When you believed in that program, here, here, you don't receive the Holy Ghost. Israel doesn't receive the Holy Ghost fully, the fullness of it, into the kingdom. What they were getting was, Hebrews says, a taste of the heavenly gift. You and I, we get the Holy Ghost the moment we trust Christ. They didn't. They had to have somebody lay hands. Now watch this. Somebody who was a representation uh, of Christ. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, we're about to end, but look what it says about Simon. We'll pick up next week. And when Simon saw that through laying on the hands of the, who? Apostles. Laying on the hands of the, who had the authority to lay hands and people get the Holy Ghost? The 12 apostles. Only them. Nobody else. Just the apostles. It says, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. Oh, yeah. Ha, <laughs> ha. This goof, excuse my language, he actually saw this and went, hey man, I need to get this done myself. How much did you do that? We're going back. He was going to try to buy. Ooh, man. And when Simon, he says, verse 19, saying, give me also this power. Now, whose power, who was the one who gave them the authority and power to do that? The Lord Jesus, right? God chose these men. God don't play. He just doesn't arbitrarily. We're going to see in the second session, we're in Romans 12 about the gifts of the Spirit and stuff. God choose who he gives what to in that day. Here, he thought he was going to buy it. Now we're going to end with Peter. Give me this power, verse 19, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God. What's the gift of God? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the gift of God. It's the eternal life. You thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Now, I say that because you're going to have Calvinists tell you that the gift of God in Ephesians 2, 8, this the gift of God, is faith. Calvinists believe that Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. They tell you that faith is the gift of God. That's not the gift of God. The salvation, the eternal life, the Holy Ghost is the gift of God. You thought you can get the gift of God may be purchased. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy what? Heart is not right in the sight of God. Now we're going to stop right there. The issue is that Peter had the authority from God to read their hearts. Peter had power from God as an apostle, the apostle to Israel, the head apostle, to read a man's heart. And although Simon believed, although he got water baptized, because he did not continue on in the truth, but his heart was bad, and we're going to see what's going on in, in, uh, next week. I don't know whether God forgave him or not. It doesn't say. If I had to take a wild guess, no. I, 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 as we conclude, I researched Simon, some secular history about this guy, Simon the Sorcerer. It said that after this, that I don't, you know, take it forever you want. It said that after this, 
he had made him a whole nother uh, cult, uh, um, religion, apostate, whatever, where he became the head of some, some uh, new age. We call it new age today. Some, uh, chances are he didn't, he didn't. His heart was wrong. He, 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 was, he wanted filthy lucre. And what that's teaching the little flock is, you better continue on. Can I tell you, they had to walk on eggshells, as it were, man. But the beautiful thing about grace is you and I don't. Today, if you believe Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, the moment you trust Christ, a beautiful thing about his grace, he gives you eternal life as a present possession, never to lose it. We have something the nation of Israel did not have. Let's praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians says we're already seated in the heavenly places in our Savior. May we rest in that, Father. Religion doesn't want us to rest in who we are in Christ. They take verses like this and say, see, you can believe, but all lose it. Oh, Father, when we rightly divide and listen to our Apostle Paul, we learn that one of the blessings of your grace is we're justified by faith eternally through, our, through the shed blood of Christ. We thank you for that blessing.